Welcome everyone to our Medicine and Research Alumni panel. This is uh, modified from our biochemistry panel because all of these panelists have occupations or experiences that are very relevant to what many of our biochemistry students are interested in pursuing. And the, first we'll start off with some introductions. Um, I will start first and our panelists, um, please say your name, major and graduation year, your current occupation and something interesting about yourself. Uh, and also Luisa, who is my co-rep, will be joining us soon. Okay, so my name is Hope Hua. I am a fourth year biochemistry major and I am one of the liaisons between EAP Club and the EAP Alumni Network. And that is why I am hosting this panel. Something interesting about myself is that I love to draw. <laughs> okay, passing it on to any of our panelists. I showed up first. So hi, my name is Claire Schulke. Um, I am a data scientist and computational biologist, and I work at the National Institutes of Health. Quick disclaimer, anything I say is not representative of the federal government, my offices, the NIH, blah, 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 and are my opinions only. Um, interesting thing about myself, I have, uh, since pandemic times, been making cheese. So I currently have uh, a couple of pounds of brie and camembert in various stages of becoming brie and camembert in uh, a specially outfitted wine fridge that I got off Craigslist. Wow. Happy to jump in. Uh, I'm Jerome Lee. I'm an emergency medicine and critical care physician at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Uh, do a few different things, um, some admin. I also do work for the federal government as well, but I am not none of, you know, everything I talk about today is a personal thing. Sorry. Uh, then the interesting part is actually just what happened is we just recently adopted a cat who is getting in the way of the Zoom and knocking everything over at my desk. So he might join us. Sorry about that. <laughs> nice to meet everyone. <laughs> Claire's cat seems to have made a cameo as well. Um, I'm Kat Donahoe. Uh, I graduated from Cal State LA in 2010 with uh, chemistry BS. Um, though I switched from biochemistry, so I can kind of speak to that too. Um, right now, I'm an instructional assistant at Orange Coast College. Um, essentially, I work in the chemistry stock room there and uh, help set up for the teaching labs. Um, and uh, yesterday, here's an interesting thing uh, for the for a planetarium kind of event, um, science outreach event, I made and served a lot of liquid nitrogen ice cream. So that was fun. I haven't done that since before wow. the pandemic. That's great. Okay, so moving on to our questions. Also, Lisa, if your internet is okay, um, if you would be willing to introduce yourself. Okay, uh, if not, I will begin with the questions. So our first set of questions is about your graduation and post-graduation experience. So what preparations did you make before you graduated um, and for your career path? Um, so uh, I, I forgot to say before, I graduated in 2007 uh, with a degree in applied mathematics um, and a minor in biology that was almost a major, but I didn't want to take OCAP. Um, so as far as uh, pre-prep for graduation, um, if you are thinking about going into a PhD, uh, now is the time that, well, a couple of years ago is probably when you should have started prepping, and now is the next best time to start prepping. Um, so I, I had done uh, research stuff with a PI, with an investigator, a professor at uh, Cal State LA, and I'd done a couple of summer internships uh, with uh, research experience for undergraduates and other stuff. Um, and I can conclusively say I would not have gotten into any graduate schools if I had not done that stuff. Um, in addition, I applied to a ton of graduate schools. So I applied, I think, to six, um, which is a lot, um, and had an idea of, of where I was interested in going the most and um, was prepared to do that. That's the short story. Thank you for sharing. 
Yeah, um, applying to graduate school is essentially a year-long process itself. Um, I, I assume that if you're embarking on that, you already have some idea of whether you like research. You've done some either with a professor at Cal State LA or as a summer um, experience. Um, if you're not sure about that or um, haven't gotten into that yet, it's not too late, but you probably want to hold off on planning for graduate school until you have. Um, in addition to just doing applications, researching programs you'd want to be in, uh, there's reaching out to PIs that you'd potentially be interested in talking to. Um, PIs are principal investigators or like the people that are in charge of your research project, um, not private eyes. <laughs> yeah, just piggybacking off what uh, they said is, so I don't think I said it, I graduated in 99 with a chemistry degree. And uh, I'll say that I initially was thinking of med school, but I wasn't quite sure I did apply, ended up not getting into any of them the first time I applied, I'll fully admit that. Uh, knowing that I also was not sure if I wanted to really do it and ended up doing more research for about two years, ended up getting a master's in public health as well. Um, but I think that the big question is, you know, it's like what I think everyone's been saying is sort of think about research. And if you're thinking about med school, be sure it's what you want to do and sort of stack everything around that. And so for me, I ended up um, doing a lot of different things to sort of prove to myself that I wanted to do it. For example, I ended up like volunteering for the Red Cross disaster teams, I ended up doing uh, becoming an EMT. I just wanted to see if I wanted more clinical care versus research or a combination of both, because there's also the MD PhD programs too from the medical pathway. Uh, so just things to think about, but there's a lot of options, uh, but definitely research and sort of getting involved and being sure that's sort of the pathway you want is key. Do you guys have any recommendations for students who are looking into these programs? Where should they look? Um, how did you guys get into these programs that you guys are talking about? Your research experience, your volunteer, your EMT experience. So I had the absolutely wild, um, like almost boomer-esque experience with uh, getting a research position. Um, I knew, so I was a mathematician and I liked biology fine, but I wasn't like, oh my God, I have to work on cancer because my pet hamster died of cancer when I was six years old. And since then I've been studying nothing but cancer and I wasn't one of those people. So I like, wasn't a selling, I, I wasn't like selling myself hard on any of those things. Um, but I went in the bio department because I was like, I know I need bio research if I want to go into biomedical research. Um, and I knocked on doors. And uh, the first door, they said, who the hell are you? Why do you want to get in here? Go away. Um, second door, no one was there. Third door, there's a guy there and he was like, wow, you're just like a rando and knocking on my door. But like, you sound pretty cool. Um, I'd totally hire you, but I'm retiring next week. Like that was legit what he told me. He was like, but um, there's this dude down the hall for me uh, named Dr. Ducharnay who, uh, who who actually needs someone who can do programming. Can you do programming? And I was like, nah, but I'm taking a class. I'll try it. And he was like, all right, well, go go talk to Dr. D and see what's up. And so I walked into Dr. D's office. Well, I'm, I'm, I think I emailed him a couple times and was like, hey, your buddy who likes chickens down the way said that you might like me. Um, he was like, cool, can you program? And I was like, no, but I can use a word processor. He's like, that's better than everyone else. You're hired. And uh, <laughs> I worked with him for three years um, and, and did a bunch of stuff with him. And, and he, was, he was one of my recommenders for grad school. So uh, other than that, doing summer internships was lots of internet searches, lots of applications to things, lots of lots of no's. I got a lot of no's. I applied to a lot of things and people said, I don't want you. Um, yeah. Thank you. I I actually took a class with Dr. Deshaun. He was teaching biostatistics when I decided to take it. <laughs> um, does anyone else want to? Solid dude. Yeah, I'll jump in and say it. a lot of no's, I'll say. Same thing, right? It's uh, just expect to be, um, you know, 
expect that you have to knock on a lot of doors, cold call, cold email folks. Um, and that's okay. You know, don't be discouraged knowing that you'll find the perfect match at some point, whether it's research related, whether it's a clinical uh, thing that you want to do, whether it's a volunteer opportunity, but just keep, uh, you know, moving forward, assuming that's definitely what you feel like you want to do. It's going to work out uh, and it always works out for whatever you decide to do. But, uh, you know, exactly the same. Um, made a lot of calls, tried to decide on which programs I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. Um, ended up doing a bunch of like different internships throughout my career. I was in DC for a bit, Rochester for a bit, and just moved around and got a great amount of experience and learned a ton. But that only sort of happened when I kept asking about opportunities, knowing that a lot of folks, I would say probably nine out of 10 said, no, we can't take you right now. They were nice about it, but they just it just wasn't something that they had available at the time. So just don't be just discouraged, keep moving forward. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Schalke mentioned uh, the research experience for undergraduates program, which is um, a nationwide, I believe, um, I believe it's run by NSF, uh, Educational right. program at various at lots of universities. Uh, usually, it comes with a stipend. I think always it comes with a stipend. Um, so look out for that in summer. Uh, I will shout out. Um, I did my first research summer internship um, at Huntington Medical Research Institute, which is sort of a research arm affiliated with Huntington Hospital. That was a really great experience for me when I was in Easter, so, uh, but yeah, also just talk to your professors and ask around and you'll find somewhere. And that's a great point. I think definitely use your network, right? Use your friends, your professors, folks you trust um, to sort of help you as well, brainstorm and figure out who you should contact and who you should talk to. And like, sometimes really weird stuff happens, like legit, the, I was at a like park fair and waiting in line for food and someone was like hey i don't know you at all you should go to washington university in st louis because they have one of the oldest biocomputing networks in the united states slash the world and i was like i don't even know you who like how did you find me and they were like i i, I want two lunches and then they disappeared into the sky and um then i went to washington university in st louis for my phd so some like sometimes weird stuff happens and it, that's sometimes how life is thank you all for that insight um now lisa do you want to ask the next question sure so hello i'm Louisa, a second year mathematics major um uh, yeah, class, um, and the next question is, uh, which classes did you enjoy the most and how about the ones you didn't enjoy as much? Numerical analysis. Take numerical analysis. It's super fun, or at least I thought so. Um, but kind of following up on that, biostatistics and population genetics, um, which is what I ended up doing for my life. So not, not super surprising there. Um, I really enjoyed biochem and peak chem and all, all of the, I was a chem major, so no surprise. I like chem. Um, let's see classes that I sort of had. Uh, I, I think I kind of didn't appreciate calc when I took it in undergrad. And then later as I used it more studying analytical and physical chemistry, I really came to appreciate it. So, um, calc, it, it may not feel like. It may feel like something you have to do, but it is um, a great tool for many things. It's interesting that you said PCHEM because a lot of people that I've come across just did not like PCHEM at all. <laughs> You're one of the few. I mean, I also enjoyed PCHEM, but if you're like struggling in those or in, in physics courses, take a differential equations course. There's like a, there's like a 250, or a, like an early 300s level differential equations course. And that explains literally all of physics, like the harder physics up until like physics four, all of it is explained in like an afternoon and all of PCHEM, just all of it. 
And it was so maddening that they didn't make me take that before I took those other things because I learned all the bullshit in like rote memorization. And then I walked into differential equations and they're like, here's a simple way to derive this all immediately and understand it. And I was like, wow, that, that sounds amazing. I think that's good advice for any of our biochemistry majors who may not want to take PCHEM because they're concerned for the math and the rote memorization of those equations. So I'm sure that's a great recommendation. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Lee? I'm not sure I can really add to it. I, I started EEP in 1993, I'll say. And so I don't remember back then <laughs> and what courses I take. Uh, took. But I'll say that as a clinician and I do health services research that um, not just there, but my, during my master's and medical school and also probably during undergrad, uh, for what I do, I think statistics or anything related to statistics, I mean, statistics is key. I hated PCHEM as well. I had to take it since I was a chemistry major to graduate. Uh, but the statistics part was is amazing for what we have to do now, what I have to do now. But yeah, I can't even remember the specific classes I had to take. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. It's, it's a good idea. I think statistics as, I mean, Claire's entire job for the most part is statistics and it really speaks to how important it is in today there's so much data out there and you need to characterize it right and the startling lack of knowledge of most clinicians that i ever encounter of even basic mathematics <laughs> is terrifying and uh some of the underpinning of my basic mistrust of all of my doctors <laughs> and without mathematicians <laughs> Okay, so moving on to our next question. Did you feel prepared for your desired path after graduation? No. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't. And um, that's, I, I went to graduate school right out of undergrad and crashed and burned real hard. Um, and, you know, took some time off to work and I'm actually going back uh, this fall. But I... Um, I wasn't, and uh, I wasn't really prepared to deal with some of the setbacks I dealt with or to uh, kind of reach out to people for help. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll say that. Thank you for sharing. Um, so I, I took my, like, my time in college pretty slow. I took about six years, um, including a year abroad or semester abroad and kind of just doing what I want for courses, coursework for a lot of it. Like I took a bunch of 400 level coursework that wasn't in my area that was like in the art department or in whatever. Um, and I was very emotionally ready to be done with undergrad. By the time I hit the end of undergrad, um, I was slightly off time for joining grad school. So I had about six months off um, to kind of like, I worked uh, as a tutor and did some other stuff. Um, going into graduate school straight from undergrad is sure a thing you can do. Um, in some pe people's cases, it may not be a, a great thing to do um, just because like you're in an environment where you're really like going into grad school, I always say is like, uh, like being a mail order bride because uh, you uh, get you get sold to a PI like a, like chattel, like smart chattel, um, and you are tasked with working and advocating for yourself and balancing their priorities and their kind of their emotional states and their work problems as well as your own. And that's like that's advanced peopling. That some people aren't ready to do like you're if you aren't able to manage yourself really well and be aware of other people then you will not do well as a as a mail order grad student um and all grad students are essentially mail order grad students um but that said going into grad school for me was a very good going into grad school life for me move. was a very good because it was in a lot of other people who are coming from a lot of different places into the same environment. And I understood like, okay, everyone here is new. The point of the first three months is to build social connections that you will then leverage for the next six years. 
And like, I understood that and, and kind of went head first into that. Um, but if you're not ready to do that, and if you're not ready to maybe live on your own for the first time and maybe do your own grocery shopping for the first time and pay your own car note and do all that stuff, then yeah, that, that's a hard transition because you are, you are going straight to hard mode in the peopling life and kind of emotional balance realm. Yeah, fully agree with Claire and Catherine here that no, the answer is definitely no. But I think that's also okay because every, at least on the medical pathway, you know, you get into med school and med school will be different from anything else you do and have done uh, for everyone though. But so your whole class together will do something separate and same with grad school, same with anything else you decide. And then you go into residency, fellowship, job, whatever, and it keeps going. But at each stage, um, it's always going to be new. It's going to be exciting, but it's also going to require a mix of both the academic side and also sort of living life and doing everything else. But just having that come together. For me personally, I'll say that I was very happy that how things worked out for me, where I ended up taking four years off between graduating from EAP and um, getting into med school and going through med school pathway. You know, I, I did a master's, I worked different jobs then, but I also, you know, gained a lot of, uh, life skills, I would say. I lived by myself, found my own apartment, you know, found, figured out how to feed myself. There's all these other things that sort of happened over four years before I joined med school. And then uh, I was about the same age as everyone then, by then, but at the same time, it was really a good four years. Um, so, uh, you know, you never know where life is going to take you, but I think we continue learning and growing regardless, and that's key. Thank you. That's really amazing insight that I think um, a lot of us probably didn't think about. Um, so in your preparations for um, post-graduation, is there anything that you would have done differently? I mean, I'm, I'm one of the like super long-term planning kind of people that's like every, everything is like a complex set of dominoes set up. And so there's like, you can't change one thing and have any of the sequelae actually happen. Um, so for me, it was, it was set up. Um, I think the, the one thing I would change about applying to graduate schools was there are a bunch of graduate programs that straight up were not interested in mathematicians. Um, I got the flat out response of you obviously don't know enough biology to be part of this program. And I was like, you obviously didn't read my application, but um, so in some cases, because you do in a lot of cases have to pay cash money to get an application in their door. Um, it's definitely worthwhile for them to not have very uh, transparent requirements for uh getting an application in their door accepted um so i would have probably done a little more legwork there as far as seeing if there are actually people like me being accepted into their programs um and that would have probably cut down on my paperwork and like five hundred dollars in fees Um, uh, I mean, again, it's, uh, it was a long time ago for me, uh, for college and applications. I don't think I would change anything, but it was similarly where unfortunately with med school applications, you apply for a lot. It's very expensive. And then if you do interview at multiple ones, uh, over the last, you know, two years it was different because a lot of it was zoom based. And I think actually was great for equity and everything else. However, you know, before this and probably post COVID, unfortunately, it's probably going to go back to in-person interviews and it's very high cost. Right. And so thinking back, I would say that that, that was probably one of the tougher parts is I think I probably would have decided to apply later once I was sure that I wanted to do it. So I wouldn't waste the whole cycle of time and energy and, you know, of course, funds and money, of course. Yeah. Um, I think, I think like, uh, like Claire said, there's not a lot of transparency and I think there is kind of, um, 
I don't want to say that graduate and medical schools prey on people's insecurities, but they sort of do. Uh, I, I would say um, know your own value. Know uh, what you bring. Know that you are ready and a good candidate uh, because that'll put you in a better position to do your research on your own terms, um, to really, yeah, represent yourself well. And the other thing that I always tell, all, so I, I end up having a lot of undergrad, um, like summer research people that just kind of fall in my lap because that's what happens at NIH. Um, and I always tell them, if you can think of something else that you could do that's not getting a PhD that would make you happy, maybe try doing that first. Because after you do the PhD, you're like, well, I did this, I kind of got to use it. Even if maybe I actually wanted to be a fry cook and I would have been the best fry cook ever. Like if there's something else that you can do that you think, or that you think might make you just as happy as getting a PhD, try that thing. I mean, I'll say that uh, a lot of my colleagues are MD PhDs and um, they've all told me, I mean, this is also all the way down the path and there's folks who go mostly into research as well, but on the clinical side for folks I, I do and work with, uh, they all also said that most likely they, if they went back, probably wouldn't have done the PhD part just because of where they were and what they're doing now on the clinical side. But knowing that, you know, at the very beginning, you're not sure which path you're going to do, or if you want to end up doing both. Um, but I will also say that if you're thinking about, uh, you know, a medical school pathway, maybe even a medical school with a PhD pathway, that it's, it's really hard and probably impossible to do everything, right? We all want to do everything, but you really only have so many hours in a day. You, you won't be able to. So you can be a good researcher uh, or you can be a good clinician and probably will be hard to do both. You can be a clinician with a little bit of research is what I am versus a good researcher with a little bit of clinical time on the side. And if they're not paying you to go to grad school, you shouldn't be in grad school. If they are not willing to put up the cash to pay for your life, for your health insurance, for your salary, for all that stuff, then don't do it because they don't think you're worth it. I think that's great advice. I think many of our Eepsters, or many Eepsters would uh, really benefit from hearing all of these things. A lot of times with students in EAP, we think that there is this like one straight path that we have to take. And a lot of us don't explore. And sometimes I think um, students would really benefit from that exploring. So thank you very much for sharing your insight. Okay, so our next questions, I think, are about um, a little bit more detail into what you do, your current occupation. So um, our first question is, why did you decide to pursue your profession? Um, I have never been one of those people that's like, I, I live for my work or I, you know, I would die without my work. Like if I, if I had my salary and could go like farm sheep, I'd probably go do that. Um, but I knew a, I have to have a job if I want to live in modern society, B I'd like to be a good job that doesn't like destroy my soul or my life or force me to be a workaholic and C I'd like it, you know, to maybe be mentally engaging and kind of fun or, you know, do something useful. Um, and coming out with a math degree, I got a lot of, Oh, you're a woman in a math program so you're going to be a teacher right and i was like mm, that's super sexist and also awful no um so i knew i wanted to go into like research um but i i basically have kind of looked for a better place to be that matches my skills and interests with every step. And I've gone from being an applied mathematician to being a computational biologist, to being a um, 
like program manager, which is somebody who like helps grants, like research grants and stuff, do the stuff they do properly to actually going back to doing data science stuff, but in a biology area. Um, and I was very much just like, I'm, I want to take steps that will improve my life and quality of life. And data scientist has a lot of like cachet and like fanciness with it right now, such that I can get way more dollars and respect as a data scientist than as a computational biologist um, because of how the world is. Um, that said, I have skills and I could call myself either one and it's fine. Um, but what I put on my little card says data scientist. Um, and yeah, who you work for matters so much more than anyone even ever told you. Um, whether that's your coworkers or your supervisors or whatever, um, those people can make your job good or make your job bad. And it doesn't really have anything to do with what you're doing day to day in your job. It's, it's those people and how competent they are at being people and at managing. Yeah, I I agree with that. You can you can have a job that is something you really enjoy, but if the environment isn't right, it can really uh, sap your love for it very quickly, um, and also sap everything else. So um, watch out for. Yeah, no, fully agree with those sentiments. Um, and so it also, I guess, going back to sort of choosing the right PI research mentor or just mentor in general doesn't even have to be research mentor right it's, it's about the mentors th themselves right whoever they are to be sure it's a good fit and someone who will advocate for you and also you know take the time to uh, figure out what is best for you knowing that it's not about the project so i'll say that when i first started thinking about it went back in the day and this was probably when i was a eatster as well was i wanted to focus on the project right i wanted to find the cool project and do that. But I quickly realized that sometimes a cool project had a really bad mentor, and that's just not a good fit, right? It's really a, about less the research project or the project itself. It's really about the person and the people associated with it. Um, apologies, I forgot the original question. <laughs> what was the original so question? The original question is, why did you decide to pursue your profession? So for me personally, I'll say uh, when I um, graduated, I thought I was going to go down the research pathway and ended up working in the research lab doing chemistry things for a public health group that was uh, building antivirals. And so it was sort of a perfect fit in that I was, I liked the biologic side, but I also loved chemistry. And I realized very quickly that I hated it. <laughs> I hated being in a lab, hated the isolation. And so that's when I realized I wanted something more personally. So I ended up, you know, doing all these other things, becoming an EMT and actually did a ton of climbing. And with a lot of my friends who were climbing most of the time and we were working on the lab and then all my EMT work, it all sort of came together. And I decided, you know, I still don't want to be a doctor at that point. I don't think I do. Um, ended up doing my best master's in public health and realized that I actually do want to see patients. But at the same time, I wanted to be able to still do research. So I had my master's in public health and then went to med school and worked and sort of put it all together. And that's where I am now, where I am, like I said before, mostly clinical. I see and do a good amount of admin, but I still do a little bit of research on the side, knowing that I'm not going to be a full-fledged researcher, uh, but I still enjoy it. I love the thinking of it. And, and I think makes my clinical practice better. Um, and building on that, on, and also on something Hope said, earlier it's it's not a straight line and it's often not necessarily what you thought it would be it's um it's less here's the goal and here's all the steps that'll reach it for me for me i know other people other eatsters who very much had one thing in mind and took a straight shot there and they're doing great um but sometimes it's you know what 
skills can this opportunity, even if it's not exactly where I would have pictured myself going, give me? And what could I learn from this? And, and building on uh, Jerome's uh, comment, a lot of times our perception of what a job inv involves doing day to day and what you do day to day in the job when you're actually doing it are wildly different. And you don't know that until you either observe someone in that job, know someone in that job who is candidly going to tell you that thing or experience that job while doing it for you know, maybe the rest of your life, because now you have an MD and that's what you're going to do. Um, I mean, I know people who have gotten, gotten their JD and uh, then decided they wanted an MD too, and gone and done that instead. Um, my advisor in graduate school got an MD, uh, did, did his, uh, his, his training to do pediatrics, did his training to do cardiology, realized he didn't like being a pediatric cardiologist. <laughs> Um, and then got a PhD. So that is, that is the stupid way to do things, but it's the way he did it. Um, but yeah, it's like, that's, that's one of the reasons I think all of us were saying, try doing the thing before you, you know, commit to doing the thing forever, partially because you want to know you like doing it, or it's at least, you know, palatable for the rewards, but also doing the thing will get you what you need to get into grad school or to get into med school or to get into whatever the training is that you need to continue to do that thing. And um, what do you enjoy most about what you do and uh, what do you dislike about it? Um, I mean, I like working with a lot of really smart people, uh, working at the end. So I have like not what a lot of people would call a dream job as far as like I work for the federal government and that's super exciting. Um, and there's like ups and downs and there's like, I care a lot more about elections now than I ever did. Um, especially living in California. Um, but I like, I like I myself, I know myself, I'm extremely risk averse. And so I know, where my paycheck's coming from and probably that the federal government isn't going to collapse anytime soon. Um, and that my, my job isn't with a startup that's maybe going to go bust. Um, so I enjoy those things, but I also just enjoy working with folks who are actually super smart and good at their jobs. Like that's, that's very satisfying. Yeah. And I, I'll say that I, I very much enjoy sort of the, the whole, the whole spectrum of what I do from, you know, interacting with patients to my colleagues to coming together on. So what, um, what I quickly realized is that, you know, when we do medicine, nothing's black and white, right? It's not that someone does CPR and someone wakes up immediately afterwards, right? On like we see on TV, but that's true of everything. Every diagnosis, it's not black and white. It's not yes or no. It's always a spectrum. And and very dynamic and messy. So clinical medicine is messy. And I actually very much enjoy that, knowing that you have to bring together a group of you know, ex specialists, friends, working with the patient, working with families, working with even the hospital admin, or maybe even other hospitals, to try to figure out what's going on. And sort of managing that dynamic, I think is, is great and something that I enjoy. What I don't like, you know, every job has its pain points, right? And so you definitely have to think about the pain points. And it's hard when you can't do what you want for your patients, uh, especially in depending on the climate and everything else. And a lot of that is out of our control, right? Um, and it could be, you know, insurance related or systems related, but generally it's not the individual clinicians wanting to not help. It's just sort of the system's not set up for that. And that can be frustrating. And so I've seen a lot of folks leave medicine too. And so, you know, for all the folks that have joined and had second careers, uh, like Clarissa was talking about, like we have a bunch of JDs who got MDs, a bunch of uh, finance folks who made their millions in, uh, you know, in Wall Street and then got their, um, came back to med school. There's a lot of folks like that, but there's also probably similar amount who, never practice medicine again. They, they leave medicine and do something else with their MD. Um, and so, so there's, a, there's a little bit of both, but overall I do enjoy it. 
Um, so what I, what finally, I realized I sort of missed about doing research after stepping away from it a bit is um, how much, uh, it, it's basically an excuse to just teach yourself new things all the time um, and get paid for it. Uh, sometimes not paid very much, but still. Um, and, you know, being able to work on a problem for a sustained period of time and uh, really kind of dig into it, um, I think is uh, very rewarding, however you come at it. Thank you for sharing. Um, so our next question is, are there any common misconceptions about your work? I think that ties into what um, Claire said earlier about how you may not know what that job actually is like if you don't have someone, a mentor or someone else to tell you what it's like. Sometimes it's not everything as Dr. <laughs> Lee mentioned, uh, like it's on the TV screen, <laughs> so. I would say in, in my part of the world, the most common misconception is that you don't need soft skills to be in science, that you don't need the interpersonal skills. Um, and part of that is because a lot of a lot of scientists are neurodiverse in some way. Um, it's it's definitely a haven for weirdos and the weird. Um, but if you have those soft skills on top of being a smart analytical person, um, that is like the single most powerful thing that will set you apart from literally all of your colleagues. Um, and I have seen scientists who are very, very smart and very, very good at doing science, absolutely crash and burn in their careers because they didn't have the soft skills that they needed. And that's like the interpersonal skills, the social skills, the, um, the networking skills and the like hustle skills. Cause science is a hustle. You're always uh, looking for more grant money. You're always looking for your next project. You're always looking for more students. You're looking for collaborators. Um, and if you don't have those skills and use them all the time, uh, you may crash and burn. If you do have them, you may be like a superstar. And they can be developed. Like if you're, if you're a failure as a human right now, cool, you got time, work on it. There are ways that you can improve that. I just want to reiterate that uh, from the physician side and clinical side, it's, it's, it's messy, right? It's not black and white. Um, it's not like, unfortunately, like television or anything else. Uh, even though, you know, ER, I met the, the guy who uh, was the physician on set for ER, and it was great that he, he told us that he was uh, with the director and they could stop the scene at any point to make it more you know, medically sound. However, it was still dramatized, of course, in, in so many ways that I would just say that um, I, think, I think that it's a problem for us physicians and we did it to ourselves is we made it look like we can fix and heal anything. And that's definitely not true. There's some things that we can fix. Most we cannot. And a lot of it is that sort of working through what we have and trying to get folks the best they can. Um, I think a thing that is kind of frequently invisible in, uh, I would say also for clinical um, careers is how much failure is involved and how much of what you need is how to identify and recover from failure. Um, and I think, I know that for me, when I was an Eepster, I was not good at handling um, failure or setbacks generally. And that is, I think, the number one thing that you have to develop to be a successful anything, really, but especially in academic research. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing. Um, I think that gives a lot of insight. We've also heard that from a lot of uh, our other panelists in our previous panels that in EAP, as I said before, there's like this, a lot of this idea that everyone, 
has that one path, right? And you can't deviate from it. And I think we've heard a lot of panelists say that that was one of their issues that they had to fix as they progressed and moved forward. So thank you for sharing. Okay, so Lisa, I wanna ask the next question. Um, yeah, okay. our next question is, uh, how do you maintain a work-life balance? Uh, with, with a lot of effort and conscious focus. Um, so one, one thing about being a scientist, um, if you want it to swallow your life and eat all your free time and, you know, make up all of your interpersonal relationships and activities, and that, that's a thing that you can do real easy and it's, it's promoted and it is, it is, uh, encouraged and it is absolutely going to destroy you. Um, so, I mean, uh, this is a, like every job move I have made, I have made it consciously with my own like work-life balance as like part of that. Um, that said, you know, if you are a woman and wanting to have babies, uh, science, super awful at that. Um, and really not good at the whole, oh, where were you for the last three years, um, thing. So I, I haven't done that personally, but I have observed others having that problem. Um, but yeah, I, I have a strict nine to five. I work, I work my hours. I work hard during my hours. I get my stuff done. If I get my stuff done by three, I kind of faff off until five. Like if I do all my work then I just, I'm not going to find more. Um, and that's, that's how I manage. And maybe I'll jump in here. Uh, so um, it's a work in progress, I'll say. And then I also did med school residency training during the era, unfortunately, when work-life balance wasn't really a thing that was part of medicine at all. And if there's any silver lining with COVID, I'll say, um, is that there's a lot more focus on wellness among the physician and clinical and nursing community than that there ever was, uh, ever, I think, in the history of medicine, which is great. Um, and so I think that it's going to only get better knowing that balance is very tough. And a lot of folks do end up going into and picking specialties and essentially, you know, choosing by walking with their feet where you can have some balance in your life. And so you're not consumed with work. But like Claire said, in medicine, you can easily, and unfortunately, I will say that I do get fully consumed with what I do and end up taking calls at night, sometimes till midnight. But more and more since COVID, I've been blocking off more time with family. We have a seven-year-old and now a cat that won't leave me alone. So it's all good. <laughs> but yeah, but it is something to please think about as you go through the process, because we can always work more. But in the end, um, you know, you, you definitely need to think about everything else. Yeah, I, um, I don't have a lot to add to that. It's, uh, you have to choose to do it. Um, and it's very tempting not to. Um, but you have to look at it as an investment in your own life and your future career and your future not career um, and, you know, set what limits and boundaries let you have the balance you want, which will shift naturally depending on what's going on, you know. I'd also say there's times in like careers that require a huge amount of training, long training times that are more balanced and there's times that are less balanced. Like going up to your thesis dissertation, you're not going to be a sane, normal person who is definitely doing all the dishes. Like that's, that's not going to happen. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that you can still be aware of as something you're trying to accomplish so that maybe you can have a few minutes off here and there um, to get your, your brain back in the, in the game of life. Our next question is kind of um, in the same vein. What does success look for, like for you? Uh, 
I mean, personally for me, being able to live my life how I'd like to live it, uh, not contributing to evil things, um, maybe maybe doing some cool good things, um, not you know being forced into doing stuff I don't want to do, um, and the like bleak Americanism, like maintaining health insurance, maintaining stability for like me and my family that kind of thing um i granted my like aspirations are like pretty low i think there's great aspirations though yeah i don't think that's pretty low i, I fully agree with that i want to do some good things not evil things um and i think i think work-life balance is for me uh, a success factor uh definitely now that i'm working towards Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's um, less about achieving some particular um, career position and more about is the work I'm doing rewarding and adding to my life and does it leave me enough time to also do things outside of that that I care about, spending time with family and friends, donating time to um, things that are important to me. I'd also say, like, and this is a general thing about my life in science and also just my life. Um, some people have the button that goes to extrinsic motivation, where, like, people putting pressure on me makes me do things. I don't have that button anymore. They press that button so many times, so hard, so often in undergrad and grad school that it's just it's it's just a, a blank little it doesn't go anywhere um so i like don't have extrinsic motivation happening for me um and so my like personal did i do a good job did i do well enough did i accomplish something is the thing that i'm benchmarked against there's not going to be a person who like flies down from a cloud and is like, Claire, you did it. You were successful. And I'll be like, finally, like, like God himself could come down and be like, Claire, you're a failure. And I'd be like, get off my butt. Like, um, yeah, these are um, really uh, great. I think for a lot of these to hear, we all, I think a lot of us have that kind of mindset of, pressure makes diamonds, but um, yeah, it's important to think about um, other things. Um, so is there anything that you regret along your career path? Not investigating the husband that mail ordered me a little better. Um, like in all seriousness, uh, like a lot of, a lot of people aren't great at being mentors and most of those people who aren't great at being mentors have no idea that they aren't. Um, so like, I don't regret how things turned out. I don't regret doing the projects I did, but I'm like, eh, I could have been a little more eyes wide open going into that uh, situation. Yeah, I had a, a long recent conversation with another EAP alum about, um, you know, most professors got there by grinding it out real hard as grad students, postdocs, early career, and they didn't learn on the way how to manage people at all, which is the main thing that you're doing when you're a research professor. Um, and so being aware of that and being aware how that manifests in your own um, mentors is very good. Uh, also not going to go too personal, but um, dealing with mental health early and uh, efficiently would have um, made a lot of things in my life go differently. Um, so throw that out. And no, I think I think we spoke a lot about mentors, and I would fully agree and you know double down on all that and say that 
even outside of research in the clinical realm from physicians, uh, when you go through med school, start residency, you're going to meet a lot of folks who are very smart, who learned a lot, but who never really got any education on managing teams, managing folks. And, and it's sort of expected that you try to figure it out on your own. But I think now healthcare has really come around to showing that that's not the way it has to be. It actually requires dedicated focus and teaching. And, I, and that's fully true of academia as well. And so just be careful, right? And I think that's what uh, Catherine and Claire were saying is be careful where, you know, you find mentors, even if you're working with a senior resident or someone who was above you, and they can be toxic. But knowing that it's going to be a short-lived period and you can sort of get through that. Uh, but a lot of times, especially if it's a research mentor, you can move on and do something else. It's all about the people. Find the right people. Find the right folks uh, to surround you with uh, to sort of get through it. Thank you all so much for sharing. Uh, I think you guys do make a very, very great point about the people and the community. And that's why I think Heath is so great because there is that community of people and supports when you're transitioning into college from uh, generally middle school. <laughs> um, and so that brings us to our last set of questions about EAP. So how did your experience in EAP impact you? I mean, this is going to be a weird thing to say, but like, not, not a whole lot. Um, like it, it was, it was the right choice for me at the time. It was like, I, I needed, I needed to be out of high school at that point. Um, I started when I was 14. Um, it was, it was the right choice for me, but after graduating, after getting into grad school, after starting a career, like nobody asked me how old I was when I started college, no one cared. Um, and you look at someone, you're like, I mean, they're somewhere between like 30 and 45. Okay, that, that, that's a pretty wide range. Doesn't really matter anymore. Um, honestly, I'd say my experience uh, in EAP as a state college was like some of the more unique parts, uh, especially when compared to a lot of other folks in grad school that I went to um, who you know, didn't go to a community college, didn't go to somewhere so big, didn't, uh, were in a situation where they were getting the, like, push towards a research mentor in their sophomore year. Um, you know, those kinds of things uh, were, were much, much different for me um, as someone who went to state college than for someone who went to ye old, you know, Ivy League or any of the other options that a lot of people went to. And I don't think I got like a crappier education at a state college. I think I had a very different experience than they did. Uh, I, I'll, I'll say I'll, I greatly enjoyed EAP um, in many ways. I think I needed it where I was at a point where I needed to find, again, the folks who I got along with, can sort of relate to, and just, uh, you know, had a nice cadre of friends that uh, sort of worked out very well and was exactly what I needed at that point. And I fully agree, too, that once, you know, out of that job, whatever, at EAP itself is... Um, Le not less important. It definitely was key to my formative years, but at the same time, we don't really think about it. I don't even, most days I don't, I actually forgot that I went through EAP until I recently saw James's message about this. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, but I think that's true as, you know, we just get older and things you have to do, but it was key. And, you know, some of my best memories were of my friends in the old EAP room. I think this was still, I forget what hall it was, but it was not even the new fancy one. It was this tiny, tiny little place with like two couches and, <laughs> and a tiny office on the side. Uh, so yeah, back in the day, but it was great. Um, yeah, so, so I will say that I think, um, Again, the, the sort of need aspect was a big thing for me at the time. And I think also um, not being, you know, big fish in a small pond um, 
kind of is an important adjustment to have uh, and, you know, keeps being relevant. Uh, I, I do also agree with Claire about the um, state college experience, you know, having friends who I met through my upper division college classes or through my tutoring job who uh, were first generation college students who were working to support families. That's again, that's not an experience that a lot of people who sort of have the more tra traditionally elite grad school pipeline experience are familiar with. And I think that's very valuable. Uh, and also, yeah, the, the community, the network, the um, support, um, you know, is still makes a big impact in my life. Um, yeah, that's uh, great. And is uh, I guess our last kind of question is, um, what was the most um, beneficial thing for your experience in EAP? And did you face any challenges because you're an EAPster, um, either as an undergrad student or um, post-graduation? I'd say, so my, my uh, starting graduate school was really well-timed because I also turned 21, like right before then, um, which uh, for those unfamiliar, graduate school generally has, in, in my experience, granted, I was in St. Louis, which is like the, the home of Anheuser-Busch and like many other breweries and stuff, but they're like, we believe in alcohol and the power of alcohol to promote science. Um, and if I had showed up as, as a 20 year old, that maybe would have been more difficult. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my kind of weird eep fallout thing. Um, so I was 19 when I did my first round of grad school and, uh, in a very rural a uh, college town where again the uh, the drinking was abundant and um, had less problems than you would have thought. Uh, mostly because no one had a lot of qualms about giving me beer, which maybe not the best thing. Um, uh, occasionally, it'll logistically come up that I don't have a high school diploma, and you you, you got to figure out whatever uh, combination of lies and truths gets you through those situations. So. But other than that, I would say it's I've just never mentioned it, and no one has ever <laughs> asked Dr. Schulke, "Do you have a high school diploma?" Oh no, I mean things like, um, <laughs> like financial aid for <laughs> ah, yes, want, okay. yeah, fellowships for some reason would a kid, uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, that's. I think that's the only thing would be definitely a high school diploma an issue for random little things so i tried to ignore it too sometimes it keeps coming back and then i would have to make calls to sort of convince folks that i do have my degrees and my doctorate i don't have my high school diploma is that okay but i can't check that box so i can't submit the application <laughs> do you guys uh, based on that do you guys recommend perhaps going back for the high school um equivalency exam or do you think that's not as big of an issue just call people just call yeah. people and explain it's a good life skill yep. and if you're like if you're super up and if you're super anxious and worried about it and you're taking gres it's it's the same stuff just just pop it off on a weekend like it's it's not hard <laughs> All right, I think that concludes our panel. Thank you all so much for coming. It was great hearing from your experiences. I'm sure there's a lot of things that Eepsters will find important and relevant for them through this panel. And if you guys have any other questions, comments, last thoughts, um, last things you wanna say to uh, the Eepsters who will be watching this, please go ahead and toss it out now. <laughs> I'll just say thank you, Hope. Thank you, Louisa, for hosting us and having us. Um, amazing moderation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and good luck to everybody thinking about grad school or thinking about med school or 
uh, not thinking about much of anything and worrying about that. Um, there are there are ways to get jobs that don't involve graduate school and medical school. So yeah, it's a, it's a great time to enter public health um, for various reasons, right? As, as unfortunately the ongoing pandemic sort of highlighted the need for public health. And I think it's the right time for everything from funding to folks wanting to enter the space, knowing that also public health is such a big field. So I would say like anything, think about what you want to specialize within it, right? You can do everything from pure research to even more field work, like you said, and then there's a whole global health component, if that's of interest to, to you. Um, but most, you know, master's programs or even PhD programs in public health require a practicum uh, for your thesis or whatever it is. So like I had to do a thesis, even for my master's, I spent uh, a whole year with a, an, a, an essentially an NGO within North Philly uh, in the specialty I wanted to do. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, to get involved. And it could be on a governmental side, non-governmental side, academic side, happy to talk offline too, but so much to do in that space. And thank you for wanting to join. I'll say also that you know, COVID, a lot of physicians have quit because of it, and a lot more public health specialists have quit. And there's a lot of open positions out there, a lot of difficult jobs and difficult uh, things to do out there. So it's a, it's a growth field. Uh, last question then. Will, are all of you guys okay with us sharing your emails with any students like Milton that would be interested in contacting you? All right, sounds good. Okay. Um, I believe that concludes our panel. Thank you again very, very much for coming. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed meeting with you and talking to you and learning about your experiences. Also, thank you, Juan, for being there and helping us uh, stream YouTube. <laughs> so um, yeah, again, thank you for coming. Thank you, Louisa, for being my co-host. And uh, I will share your email with your emails with students who would like to be in contact.